Hello everybody. Today we are going to do class number two, um, the first real lecture for you, on uh, basically an intro to educational psychology. You'll notice that these slides say they are by Dr. Shane Tutwiler from spring of 2023, but that is just because I'm using uh, some old ones that he was using and I didn't have a chance to change all that. So don't worry about it, never mind. We will just press right on. Okay, so we are not actually gonna discuss the theory to theory assignment today because that's not real. Um, I decided we weren't gonna do that. So we will discuss what we're actually gonna do at some later time. We will talk a little bit about your prior knowledge on this topic. And we will review chapter one, which is basically the introduction to educational psychology. So we're skipping this part. Skip, skip. All right. So you can take a moment to think about these things. You can pause if you want to, or you can just keep going. Think back to the last time you conducted research. Like, what was it that motivated you to do so? Um, you know, and it may have just been you looked up something you wanted to know more about. And maybe you're considering that research. Totally fine. So then the next question for that would be, was this research scientific? Um, why or why not? Like, what do you think of when you think of scientific research? Um, and have you ever done it? Uh, and then how, if at all, did this research change your mind or help you make a decision of some kind? All right, so all research starts with a question. Almost every day you answer a whole bunch of different questions by collecting and analyzing evidence, or what we will call data. For example, these very mundane things are considered research. What is the most cost-effective three-ring binder? How late can I leave and still find a parking spot? The answer at URI is not very. Um, does lack of sleep impact my ability to learn, right? So when we are answering questions about how students learn in this class, that will require a lot of different research methodologies and has in the past uh, required a lot of different research methodologies and a lot of the theories that we learn about in this class will actually be drawn from different kinds of research that's been done in the past. So there's no one method for research that works in every situation, so we'll actually probably learn about a lot of different research methods. Okay, so there are a couple of different methodological approaches you can take. Uh, technically, there are two big ones and then one combination. So there's the quantitative approach in which we, as it says, reduce the world to measurable values and look for trends. This is where a lot of statistics come in, a lot of numbers. The qualitative approach in which we describe the richness and detail of the world in a very specific context. So this does not involve statistics generally. It does not involve numbers. It usually involves written descriptions um, and also other kinds of descriptions, but mostly written descriptions about what's happening in the world around us. And then the mixed methods approach is really a combination of the two. It puts together the power of both of those approaches. So these are terms we'll be using occasionally throughout the semester. Okay, so why is all of this important? You may be familiar with a little thing called the No Child Left Behind Act of 2001. You may be so young that you were not around for that. I was. I taught during the No Child Left Behind era. So I have a lot to say about this, but I probably won't say all of it now. Um, it reauthorized the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. It gave a bunch of federal money to different programs and schools. Um, and the basic idea was they wanted to improve teacher quality. They wanted schools to be both safe and drug free. And they wanted to spend all of this good money on programs that had a scientific track record. Okay, so it's all supposed to be based on scientific research. Um, there's some debate we could have later about whether that was scientific or not. Right? So, the Education Sciences Reform Act of 2022 says that research is scientific if it uses methods appropriate to the research question that was posed. Different question you want to answer requires different methods. If it employs systematic empirical methods that draw on observation or experiment, 
Um, so you can't just be like, hey, this thing I think is happening. You have to actually observe and do some experimentation to find out. Um, relies on measurements that provide valid and reliable data. Involves data analyses that can support the findings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I like that last one. Obtains acceptance through a comparably, comparably rigorous objective and scientific review. So it's never just... We did this study and we came up with this thing, but other people actually looked at it and said, yes, this seems like it's good stuff. It's very rigorous. We like it. Okay, so some things you want to keep in mind uh, as we get to talking about research over the course of this semester. Um, correlation does not equal causation. Just because there's a relationship between two things, potentially, um, in the data does not mean that one thing caused the other. So, for example, we have this lovely chart here, which shows me that per capita consumption of mozzarella cheese correlates with civil engineering doctorates awarded. If you look at the lines, right, you've got this red line here, which is mozzarella cheese consumption, and then you have the civil engineering doctorates, which is the black line, and they look pretty similar, right? They look closely related, because their lines kind of follow each other. However, I don't really think we can say that eating a whole lot of mozzarella cheese makes you into a civil engineering PhD. I don't, I don't think those things affect one another. And I also don't think being a civil engineering PhD makes you eat a ton of mozzarella cheese. That all seems kind of silly to think that might be related, right? Uh, well, you know, similar numbers doesn't mean that they're actually one thing is causing the other. So always keep that in mind when we talk about research. Just because we're saying there's a relationship between something doesn't mean that that one thing definitely caused the other. Okay, so we're going to talk a lot about theories in this class and the role of theories is to, you know, there are several roles to inspire uh, new research and also refine research and then the theories themselves get refined too as you go through your research. So a research question will reflect a relationship or phenomenon that is under study. You've seen something, you're wondering if it's related to something else. You've seen something happen and you think, dang, I wonder what's contributing to that? What's causing that maybe? So that gives you a research question. Hypotheses. Uh, these are usually based on your theories, right? Which predict that your, predicts what your relationship might be. Um, for example, I may have in my mind a research question about whether or not consumption of instant noodles, which I love, is directly related to better test scores in EDC 312. Maybe I have a hypothesis. Maybe I think people who eat a lot of instant noodles are. In fact, going to do better in um, EDC 312. Sounds silly. It's kind of a silly example, but that's just a little something for you to work with. Um, so then on the, the basis on the outcome, based on the outcome, you can revise your theory. You can replace it entirely. Um, you know, maybe I find out that mass consumption of instant noodles is actually bad for people. Um, that it doesn't actually help you do better in EDC 312. That it helps you do worse, then I would have to totally revise my theory, right? My theory is now that eating a whole bunch of instant noodles will make you do worse in EDC 312, which I hope is not true because I love me some instant noodles. Okay, so are all experiments the same, right? So in a true experiment, the subjects or the people that you're watching or observing are randomly assigned into a treatment and a control group. Some of this probably sounds familiar to you from science class. And that will allow researchers to sort of make cause and effect claims, right? Because you randomly assigned people into the groups, you have a pretty safe guess that, you know, uh, there weren't other factors outside of that situation that might have affected the outcomes. In a quasi-experiment, subjects are exogenously assigned into treatment and control groups. Exogenously is a big word for you don't really have control over which group P 
people are in. So take classrooms, for example. If you decide to do a research with a classroom of students in a local school, you didn't choose which students were put in that classroom. If you decide to compare one classroom to another, again, you have groups already made. You didn't decide on them. You didn't do it randomly, so that can't be considered a true experiment. It's more of a quasi sort of experiment, right? So because the assignment was not random, there could have been a ton of other factors that factored into how the research turned out. For example, uh, maybe one teacher did the activity you were observing a little differently than the other one, right? So things like that can get into the experiment and make it impossible really for you to say that one thing definitely caused another, like the activity definitely caused students to do better work. Um, because there were other things that might have factored in. Like maybe there were more students in one class. Maybe there was a teacher who didn't understand the assignment as well as the others um, and didn't teach it as well. Lots of things can factor in. So um, we are going to skip this part because obviously you're not in class and you don't have a group. Okay. So really all this lecture for today was, was to give you a little touch of the basics of what research looks like so that as you begin reading, you will have that to work from, right? So never mind this part about the theory to theory paper. We're not doing that. I've already decided the only thing you need to do um, also this week, please go ahead and do read chapter two and do the chapter two reading guide. And look out for lecture video number two for this week, in which I will talk about the stuff that was in chapter two. So that's everything for right now. Um, go on to the second video as soon as you get ready and have some time to do it. Thanks. Hope you have a great day.